I hope so. Okay, we're getting ready. Okay, in this part of the lesson, we're going to pick up, I think we're going to move on past the funeral issue, if that's okay with you, because we have some things to cover still. Uh, let's talk for a few minutes about death as loss and the kinds of things that you lose when you die. And, the, and that's part of probably why most people are not real fond of the thought of death. Now, once in a while, you may meet someone who says, Ooh, I'm curious to see what's on the other side. You know, I can hardly wait. But most people really prefer not to think about their own death, and it just harbors unpleasant thoughts. And it may be because it represents loss. Uh, one, it's a loss of experiencing. You know, or at least we're not sure. Uh, we have to get to near-death experiences before we finish tonight. You know, but, but certainly, you, even if your spirit separates from your body and if at death you move into some different metaphysical range, you're not likely to be experiencing as you are on earth. Okay, there's a loss of people, whether you're going to be the deceased or whether we're looking at it the other way. You, know, you lose the people around you, and that's a very difficult thing to deal with for most folks. Okay, there's a loss of control and competence, things that you, you know, you've been in charge and, and if you die, you're not in charge of those things anymore. You know, if I die, somebody else gets this class. <laughs> somebody else gets my office. Uh, there's a loss of capacity to complete projects and plans. And for some people, this is a very important dimension. That you just have a lot, most folks have a lot of things they want to accomplish, a lot of things they want to do. And the knowledge that death is imminent uh, cuts all of that short. <clears throat> and that can be a frustrating dimension. There's a loss of things as you know them. Uh, whatever life is like after death, uh, things will not certainly not be the way that we're accustomed to them here. You're going to lose the body that you have now. Whether you get a new body, you know, I know there's a lot of variety in religious beliefs, but if you get a new body, and some of us are certainly hoping so, uh, you know, one that's the right size, please. <laughs> oh, but, but whatever that is, you know, you're going to have to learn to cope with that, have to deal with that, and many of us would rather have a known thing a known quantity that's understandable and workable rather than risking the unknown. And so that's another potential dimension. And then loss of a dream. And we talked about that as we talked about maturational crises, that as we grow older, we often realize the dreams that we had in our youth and childhood or even in midlife simply are not going to come to pass. Uh, you're not going to be CEO of the company. You're not going to publish 15 books before you die. What, whatever that dream uh, may be, to be the best of the best or the best paid or the super star or uh, to be, you know, for some it's as simple as being a parent and you realize you never will. But death is a real final way of saying, here are the things you lost. You know, you ran out of time and you didn't make it. And, and here are the things that you lose there. Now, there are different kinds of death. And then the second half of this uh, kind of ties back into what Jacqueline was saying about the, the real classy funeral. There are ways that people try to transcend death. But the, the, the obvious form of death is physical death. All the biological functions cease um, and you're clinically dead. Okay, but there's also psychological death. In a sense, a person with Alzheimer's is psychologically dead. They're out of touch with reality. They're out of, in the final stages, uh, they're out of touch with the world. They have left the world as they knew it. Uh, there are others who just kind of move into that learned helplessness and learned hopelessness and have a kind of psychological death that it's almost like their brain waves are dead. They don't have a disease but they've ceased to function, and so psychologically they are not interactive with the people around them anymore. And then there's social death. Uh, you've been a wonderful whatever in charge of many things, you know, a socially 
successful, wonderful person, and suddenly society has turned on you and you're a has-been. You're a superstar making millions one year, and as the entertainment and, and cultural dimensions of life may go, things change and turn, and socially you're dead. Uh, maybe you're divorced, and while you were the spouse of this most exciting socialite, now you're a nothing. Okay, well, how do we cope with that? Well, some people just accept it and go on with their lives. But then there are other things that people uh, try to do. There are those who believe that they will have physical immortality, that at death they will get a new body that's even better, that's capable of, of moving at, at great speeds around the uh, universe or whatever. But there will be a continuation in some form so that, that uh, at least spiritually, and spiritual immortality is down there under three. That may or may not uh, involve a new physical body of sorts. Uh, but there are those people who attempt physical immortality by having their body frozen at the point of death. I think that's a little less popular now than it was a few years ago when the notion first hit. But the idea of, of freezing the body in the hopes of reviving it once a cure for the disease is found. And that particularly is, is a overt, very specific attempt to retain and maintain physical immortality in the body that you presently have. Mm -hmm. um, what would the Egyptian mummies be considered as? Like, you know, how they, they try to mummify, or I don't know. Well, I think they believed in physical immortality, that they're like Indians, that their whole body was going to be resurrected in another life because they needed all their stuff with them. Sort of like Indians who were buried with their horses or their war robes or whatever. Uh, these things were going with them into the next life. And so I would put that under a physical immortality. Um, psychological immortality uh, may be a, a mindset uh, kind of thing where, where uh, you want people to remember you. It may tie into some of these others uh, down here as well. If, um, oh, there's a kind of psychological immortality if you're a great author and your literary works are going to continue, then mentally we remember this person. You know, Shakespeare is psychologically immortal. Uh, Social immortality, the, the line gets thin between some of these. Spiritual immortality, legal, economic immortality. Sometimes that we erect great tombstones. Uh, uh, people give money economically. People give money and have buildings named after them so that they'll be remembered by society after they're gone. Uh, their names are, are placed in different uh, Places, or you may put your name on scholarship funds or trust funds. But anyway, th without bogging down in this, these are just uh, kinds of ways that, that people want their name to live on, want the memory of who they are to live on, whether it's a very elaborate funeral that's so unforgettable that at least a generation of people uh, who attended won't forget. Uh, but, but even longer range are the monuments and the towers and the... Uh, street signs, you know, there are just lots of things that we name to, to remember people. Okay, uh, we need to reflect for a moment, this is such a lovely topic this evening, how we die. Uh, you know, what kinds of things cause death? You know, we're just going to kind of pop through some of these, but, but we don't all just grow old and die of some kind of disease. You know, uh, whether something is natural or unnatural is kind of debatable. You know, if you smoke yourself into lung cancer, is that natural or unnatural? You know, they probably say dying of lung cancer is a natural cause, but was it or what? You know, you can kind of get into a little uh, discussion there. But just to kind of think about ways that people die and whether these are natural or not 
depends on your point of view. There's certainly disease-related and many disease-related uh, causes of death we would say are natural uh, causes of death. Uh, suicide, is suicide natural or unnatural? I don't know, uh, you know, we don't have to settle it here. Homicide, war, accidents, capital punishment, there aren't as many who die that way, but you know, frontier days, stringing them up with a rope or running them down with a posse and shooting them uh, is a kind of capital punishment. Disasters may take thousands of lives at a time. Now, is that natural or unnatural? Uh, euthanasia, and uh, the chaplain will talk some about that in the next class. But are there... Uh, are there situations where euthanasia is appropriate? And this is something each person has to answer for themselves. And it may tie into your religious beliefs too. We don't have any trouble putting a cat or a dog to sleep. I mean, it's an emotional thing, but we, we can much more easily say we do this to end the pain and suffering of the animal. Uh, it's called active euthanasia when you do something uh, like Dr. Kevorkian, uh, that literally causes the person's death, set things up so that the person uh, can flip a switch or uh, release a medication or something that causes a death. Passive euthanasia simply allows the death, where you, you reach a point and you say, uh, we're, not going, you know, we're not going to continue life support systems anymore, or we're not even going to put the person on these things to start with. And if you have strong feelings about uh, what kind of life support you want yourself put on, you know, what kind of heroic measures you want people to take for you, then um, living wills should be written up, uh, statements to that effect should be made. Nancy? Uh, when one of my uncles died, uh, he made it real clear what he wanted, but his son had a hard time with that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even if it's clear when it comes down to the people making decisions, it's still hard. So, I mean, it is good to have that written. Yeah. And this may be something you want to explore next week more with Dr. Fry because he's on a committee at MD Anderson that helps review these difficult cases. Uh, because it's not always an easy decision, even when the patient has left instructions about what they'd prefer to know when, where the point is and, and helping the family work to the point that they're able to accept that and deal with it. Okay, and then there's some things we refer to as unexplainable causes of death. Uh, the sudden infant death syndrome is one of those things. That they, I think they have a little more information about that now uh, than they used to about breathing patterns and, and there's sort of a, I may not be remembering this right, but a kind of short circuit in the nervous system that causes the breathing patterns to be off. Uh, but there are some people, and that we've got two, well you've got some more terms here, uh, side facilitators. There are some people who more than passively seem to be unresisting to death. When the, and particularly if their psychic and physical energy is low. And the question here kind of has to do with, can people will themselves to die? And I'm convinced that they can, particularly uh, these couples that have been married 40, 50, 60 years. And one dies, and it may be a very brief time, just a few days or a few weeks, until the other dies. Sometimes it's months. But one will stop eating, they just give up living. And it's almost like there's, there's a mental death wish uh, that becomes operative in the cognitive structure. Okay, uh, and it's called psychogenic mortality syndrome, particularly among the elderly when people just give up. But there's, there's a line there between willing yourself to die and just giving up and waiting to die. Some people are very influenced by numbers. And I'm not saying these things are right or wrong, that they should or should not be, 
But part of what we're talking about tonight is being aware of what's going on around you so that you can pay attention. Um, some people ha have their own life <clears throat> or perceive positive or negative dimensions to their life script based on their own family history. That if you were nine years old when your mother died, then will you die when your daughter is nine years old? Or if things seem to come up in certain number of patterns. Uh, somebody died on October 6th and someone else died on January the 6th and then on May the 16th, you know, do you get this thing with the number six? That if you're critically ill and in the hospital and the 26th of the month is coming along, are, are you suddenly going to take a turn for the worse there? And so a lot of people play head games and, and adjust their life scripts because they believe very much that the numbers take on a magical power. You want to add something? Oh, yeah. They say uh, universally, well, in the Christian countries, that there's that type of feeling with uh, the, uh, the age that Jesus died. And they, I forget what they call the Christ numerical yeah, complex. He died at like age 33. 33, and there, yeah. there is a syndrome where they, I forget the what they call it. 33 is a they, real crucial right, point. Right. I've wondered if it is for ministers, for young male ministers, but I've never been bold enough to go around asking them, how did you feel when you were 33 years old, <laughs> Karen? Well, and I know that they've, they've looked in a lot of people. They said it is very common that people will at least live, even people who are really ill, generally make it to their birthday, whatever the next one is. They, they generally don't die until sometime after the birthday. It's like, so there, you... So it kind of has has the other side of it too. There's numbers we sort of wait for. But my mm -hmm. mother, I, I really kind of right. think and that's what that positive negative there means. That yeah. sometimes we hold on until a certain date. Yeah, I'm my, not supposed to die until the sixth of the month. I mean, my mother did though sit and sort of average out the lifespan of her mother and father, and kind of you know, I mean, she sat and added, well, this one died at this age, this one died, and she added the two together, divided it, you know, and and said, well, I should pass away about this, you know, she lived beyond that. It's really surprised her. Well, good. <laughs> yeah, but but the ability, to, the psyche is a very powerful thing, whether it's a death wish or whether it's the the power to hold on and keep on going and not turn loose. And there are sometimes instances where the, there are people you think would have turned loose long ago and you're not sure why they're holding on. And I have a friend who's out of state now with her mother who's been painfully ill for a couple of years and it's not clear why she's holding on. You know, but that's her business and her psyche and so forth. But it would just, you know, sitting over here on the side looking in, it seems like it would be so much easier to just say, I'm going to give up and get this over with, rather than fighting so vigorously. But we have very different personalities and different makeups. Uh, that next term, death dips, refers to certain dates have death-related significance. Uh, just dates that other people have died or dates that... Uh, certain things happened on and and for whatever reason you need to be aware that the people around you may be particularly sensitive to that and that you know it was two years ago tomorrow that such and such happened and oh, at the minimum people may be depressed or emotionally affected oh, on the and we know that anniversary dates birth dates holidays all of those things are, are significant markers and may be influential. Uh, voodoo and hex deaths, we know that they occur. There's documentation of people who have had hexes or voodoo curses placed on them and then they've died. Now the Kalish book uh, suggests that the research, the best they can figure out that what may be happening here and I just went ahead and wrote this out to be sure I said it right, that fear affects the sympathetic adrenal system, which produces a rapid fall of blood pressure, 
and that produces the death. But you, if you allow yourself to believe this, that somebody really can put a hex on you, that so terrifies you to believe that it's been done to you. Does this fit into your research, Robert? Well, what, I was gonna, mine's kind of different. It's not that kind of lucid, but what you're asking, does the, the people have to be able to hear the curse put on them, right, before this? I would, well, I would think you'd have to, yeah. They, about it. they have to know. They have to know that the thing was put on Yeah, them. I don't know of any documentation of people that had a hex put on them and didn't know about it who died anyway unless it was just one of those fluky, random things. But it's knowing that the witch doctors or whatever sat there and did it to you, and then you, kind of the way you, kids will get themselves, some adults, psyched up in a horror house, in a haunted house, and you make yourself believe this is real. You know, but if you go into that knowing that they can be sued if they lay a hand on you, <laughs> You know, the chainsaw may catch you off guard because you don't know exactly when it's going to start. You know, and you may jump from surprise, but you won't, or you shouldn't, go into cardiac arrest from horror. Now, I say that having only been through one haunted house and <laughs> say I'm not going through another. Uh, they, may, they make me so claustrophobic that I can hardly get through them. Uh, you know, but, but it's the knowledge that the hex has been placed on you that is so terrifying that apparently the fear of what it might do produces this response within your system that may produce a rapid drop in blood pressure that then sends you into cardiac arrest. Interesting stuff. Okay, you have in your book, we just want to touch on this because we'll get to it more next class, uh, the famous Kubler-Ross model, which says people go through five stages, and we're going to compare this to the Schneider model in just a minute, The people go through five stages uh, when, when they recognize that they have to deal with loss or that, uh, particularly death. And those are denial and isolation, you know, and, and you may have heard yourself saying about things, I can't believe that happened. No, this can't be real. This is not true. This is not happening to me. Tell me this is not real. Okay. Anger, once you recognize that it has happened, it is true, it did or is happening. And this applies whether uh, you've gotten the news of a death and you're coping with that or whether you've been diagnosed as term or someone you know. Uh, you know, that there's the news that uh, someone is terminal. Okay, stage two is anger. We may get really angry. Now, who do we get angry at? God is one. Which, the deceased? Yeah. You know, how dare he die and leave me with three little kids or no money? Or, 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 or just leave me alone, you know. And anger may be a biggie, and it's a very legitimate emotion. You know, and it, there's nothing wrong with being angry. If, if you've been dumped on, anger is a natural human response. Bargaining, you know, we bargain with God. We may try to bargain with, most of us bargain with God. If, you know, I promise I'll do this if you'll just, and we try to, and even if we try not to do it, you know, if, if we think it's probably not an appropriate response to bargain with God, we may find ourselves doing it anyway. I, say, I didn't really mean to do that, but, you know, I really do mean it, that if you just fix whatever this is, I would do this. I'll do it anyway, but, you know, if you'd fix it, I'd appreciate it, and so you get in some interesting head games. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't that also include, like, um, finding your religion at the last minute? I know a lot of people that don't have a normal religion, when they know that they're going to die, then they really start praying a lot. And is that yeah. along the well, line? it may be part of bargaining, or it may be we're going to come to uh, material also that shows, you know, if you know that you have one year to live or six months, whatever the time frame is, how are you going to spend that time? 
and that will cause you to reorder your priorities in a hurry for some people. Some people will go on living exactly like they are uh, because they are who they want to be right now. But it may be that the realization that I don't know what death will bring and I want to find that out. Because you see a lot of that in the media, like dealing with death row inmates and people that have been sentenced, you know, then they all of a sudden turn to God and become, you know, very religious. And I hope it's authentic, you know, and I don't have enough information to know. Okay, depression is a natural response, you know, because we've already talked about all the things you lose with death and to be depressed at that potential loss is a legitimate response. And then uh, the fifth stage is acceptance of rec and we said you know there, there can be that healthy uh, you may be in denial which can be healthy. There's some people who think everybody has to get to acceptance and I've got at real odds with a chaplain who's no longer even in Houston. <laughs> Somebody fired him. <laughs> <But> <laughs> But, you know, but we had a real heated discussion one day about whether someone must get to acceptance or not because he was frustrated that a patient would not accept the fact that she was going to die. And I was in that other camp that said, I think that's a real healthy attitude to keep on fighting. It was a leukemia patient. Not all leukemia patients die within a given time frame and... Uh, this was a, a young woman that eventually died in her early 20s, you know, but she put up a good struggle and I think she probably lasted much longer uh, because she was in what I consider to be healthy denial. But anyway, now we don't move through these phases, one, two, three, four, five. You'll find yourself shifting back and forth. You may accept it for a while and then get angry all over again and bargain some more and then accept it for a while, but then be depressed, but accept it for a while. You'll just find yourself moving back and forth. But ultimately, long range at some point, and the time frames are different for different people. Some people need months, some people need years, uh, but at some point you reach acceptance that, okay, this really is, and the funeral may be part of what helps you do that, uh, to own the fact that this is how it has to be, and I have to go on from here. You know, I really don't have, my, my choice is death, and I'm not ready for that. So I, I have to move on from here and ex <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> accept things as they are. Okay, Schneider takes those stages and uh, expands on them a little bit and gives a little more room to, to shift back and forth uh, he says there's an initial awareness of the loss, and these are in your book if you don't want to copy them all down now. Uh, there's an initial awareness of the loss. There are attempts at limiting the awareness by holding on, you know, by, by holding on to what you had before and, and not fully acknowledging. There are attempts at limiting your awareness by letting go, by saying, okay, okay, that's over with, I understand, you know, the, the dish is gone, the person is gone, the pet is gone, I'm, I'm letting go of this and I'm trying to get on with my life. So it works both ways. Sometimes we hold on in order to cope and other times we turn loose in order to cope. Uh, at some point there's an awareness of the extent of the loss and this may be a delayed reaction. Sometimes you know right away pretty much the full ramifications but other times you don't realize that uh, the vase meant as much to you as it did, that the pet meant as much as it did, you know, that you really miss that companionship with the 10 o'clock news each night or, or you know, whatever it may be. Uh, and, and so sometimes you get this delayed reaction uh, because the full impact of the loss hits you later on. Uh, then you gain perspective on the loss, okay, because for everything you lose, you gain something else. For everything you gain, you lose something. And so you may start to get some perspective on that. If I, if I hadn't lost this spouse, then five years later, 
I wouldn't have discovered and been able to marry this wonderful person. You know, if I hadn't lost this animal, I wouldn't have gone to the shelter and brought this adorable mutt home, which is now a great part of our life. You know. So you, just, you get aware of those things and you get some perspective on it. Somehow you resolve the loss. A few people hang on, or some persons, hang on at great length for an extended period of time. But most people start to resolve this somehow. Not that the memories go away, not that the pain goes away, but over time, things just get better. And that's probably a stupid thing to say to the person at the time. You know, you're going to feel better in a few weeks. I won't believe you at the time. But know in your heart while you're here and rational and reasonably okay that time really does make hurtful things better. And it's not that you're trying to repress the memories. You know, and, I, and I know from papers that you've written for me that some of you have already been through real garbage in your lives. And if you focus on those things, you can recall that pain. But, but the time... And, and the space in between has made a difference. Okay, sometimes you reformulate the loss in the context of growth. You look at, we, we talked about every crisis is an opportunity. Every crisis has a potential for growth. You know, now that you can't do this anymore, what can you do that will make a difference in who you are and what you are and what you become and so forth? And when you get to that phase, that you can put that loss in a reformulated vision of who you are and where you're going, then you're making progress. And again, it's not to erase the memories. It's not to take away the good stuff and cause you to forget that person. It's just to say, here is where I'm going from here. Given my options, uh, this is where I see myself headed. And so ultimately, you transform the loss into new levels of attachment. It may be another spouse, it may be another pet, it may be a different career, you know, and, and this is not always, we need to go back to the kinds of personal loss. We're not always just talking about a person who's died. You know, this may be the CEO of a major company, of a Fortune 500 company, who's been fired. But when you can transform that loss into something new and meaningful, then you've worked through these stages. Okay. Uh, think about how people find out that they're dying. Okay, well, we're just going to kind of review uh, some little situations because. Like if well, if you well, have a disease, no, if not a sudden no, you you find out from some by some means that you're dying. Oh, how might that occur, Karen? Well, almost invariably, <clears throat> if it's going to be something where it's <clears throat> where where you are going to know ahead of time, I, I can't imagine any any function of that that's not going to involve medicine. I mean that that's going to be someone. So it's probably some lucky doctor gets to tell you this. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I'm sure that that's not one of their favorite things to be doing either. In fact, um, I, I remember the doctor that had to tell my husband just that it was cancer. Wasn't even, you know, years before any death or anything, just that first finding the cancer. And I know that that, you know, my husband, I wasn't in the room at the time, but he, he said that it took him a little while to bring that one out. He kind of said, yeah, we got the reports back and there was a surprise. And he kind of had to do some fidgeting before he could just, you know, come around to just saying that. Well, and, you know, you have these tests run and then normally they, the nurse calls you and tells you everything is okay. And so when the, when the call comes, it says, the doctor would like to have you come in to discuss your test results. <laughs> that in itself is a message. You know that that something's not quite right here. Oh, out of a out of Glasser and Strauss's work back in 1965, and uh, some of this is reported in Kalish. Uh, there are different awareness contexts, and people. And you might just think about this because you you may be in a position sometime 
of having to decide whether or not you're going to share unpleasant news and at what point. So there's a closed awareness context. Sometimes the physician and the family keep a conspiracy so that the patient does not know. Everybody, that's one end of the continuum. Everybody but the patient knows. Okay, but it's real hard to keep that up. So I'm told, I haven't participated in one of these. Uh, so there, the next point on the continuum is the suspicion awareness context. There are strong clues that cause the patient to become suspicious that their condition is more serious than they were told. Uh, maybe the nurse has been coming in each morning and, and you know, you say, well, you know, how's my blood pressure? How am I doing? Oh, you're doing great, Miss Han. You know, you're doing fine. She comes in and checks the chart one day and I say, well, how am I doing? And she says, you'll have to get that information from your doctor. Oops. Now, there are variations on that theme. Uh, maybe people start to look at you differently, treat you differently. They may become more patronizing or more accommodating. People that were usually their ornery, obnoxious selves start being nice to you. <laughs> I don't know. But, but you notice subtle changes in behavior, either of family members or the medical staff. Exactly. They also have a tendency to stop coming by. Mm -hmm. They're like they're detaching themselves now, gradually. That's a good point. That if the if the other people, but you know, don't assume because somebody doesn't visit that you're done in. It may be they had to work overtime, <laughs> or something. But yeah, if if you suddenly uh, almost feel like you've got leprosy, and and people are really putting distance in there, that's a clue that something peculiar may be going on. Okay. At another point on the continuum, mutual pretense, everybody knows the patient is dying, including the patient, uh, but they all pretend otherwise. And sometimes it works the other way. It's the patient in the hospital that conspire against the family. The doctors told the patient they're dying, but the patient just doesn't want to deal with having the family go all to pieces. And again, this depends on the chemistry of the family. We talked about systems theory long ago and interdependence and rippling effects and those kinds of things. So, you know, dig out those old lecture notes. Uh, but it may just be easier to pretend that everything is great so that, you know, six weeks from now I just slip into a coma and then they can all deal with each other. But I don't have to deal with, and particularly I think, well, I don't know if I can generalize this. Let me make this a might be rather than a usually. It may be in families that are not particularly close to one another, where there's not been good open communication uh, skills, that it's more difficult to own these things and to be able to say the things that you want to say. You know, and there are a lot of, of family members who are angry, who get angry with uh, the dying person because they don't get a chance to say goodbye. You know, the person never admits that they're dying and so you can't tell them how much you're going to miss them when they're not here because they're denying the fact that they're dying. Allison? Um, I was just going to share a story um, real quick. My <coughs> freshman year of high school I had uh, my best friend's mother was diagnosed with cancer of the lymph nodes, but she didn't bother to tell anybody because she knew it wasn't going to make a difference and didn't want them to grieve. And so she didn't tell anybody until like six weeks before she died. And then all of a sudden she blurted it out. And a lot of people were very upset that she did that and didn't leave them any time to really prepare themselves or anything. And that's a real touchy thing. I mean, you know, whose who's rights should take priority? here. You know, the person who is terminally ill or all the people in that individual system. And there's no easy answer to that. Okay, and then you have an open awareness context where the patient is aware and is able to discuss the dying process. Uh, to discuss that with the health providers, with family, with friends. And that's probably the healthiest if you can get to that point. 
but I know there are lots of reasons why it's not easy to get to that point. And then you may have a kind of middle knowledge or it could even say mixed knowledge where people shift back and forth. That you may shift between uh, accepting and denying, between awareness and disbelief. So that on one day uh, the terminally ill person may be able to write out a will and sign it or to give instructions about how property should be disposed of or whatever but then a couple of days later may be talking almost in fantasies about what we're going to do next summer and how great it's going to be. You know, as soon as I get out of this hospital, here's how it's going to be and we'll do this and we'll do that. Trips they're going to take. You know, and, and so that's not an uncommon thing to have happen. Okay, so here's the list of how people find out that they're dying. I've I was thinking we were doing that one next. Um, sometimes, as you've mentioned, you find out directly from a health professional. The doctor simply tells you. We got bad test results back. It's malignant. It's spread. You know, bad news. Sometimes you get it indirectly from a health professional. You overhear, and that's not good. You know, people should pay attention. Uh, but nevertheless, that's how it sometimes happens. You hear. You overhear a whispered conversation, uh, whether it's between a doctor and a nurse or two nurses or uh, a nurse and a family member, uh, whatever. Uh, other times it may, be, it may come directly or indirectly from non-health professionals. And as we were talking a minute ago, it may come from changes in the behavior of other people. They just start acting differently. Uh, there may, but a, a real big clue may be changes in medical care procedures. They increase the chemotherapy. They take you off the chemotherapy. There are treatments that you've been getting that they've suddenly discontinued and yet you're not well. Well, why have these stopped? <laughs> because they're not doing any good. They're not making any difference. And then the sixth, the self-diagnosis. You know, most people, when they find out they have an illness, read everything about that illness that they can get their hands on. And the brighter you are, you know, and the better you educate yourself about those things, then the more likely... What, Nancy? <laughs> My aunt just recently went through a lot of tests, and by the time the medical professionals told her, she knew, you know, that she was dying. And I don't know if that's good or bad. You know, I'd be one of those people that would be snarfing up as, up, as much information as I could get my hands on. You know, <laughs> but, but I'd probably wish I hadn't. You know, but that's a typical thing. And so, so and, and maybe that's good, you know, that through self-diagnosis. But a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. And you know, you could induce yourself into a heart attack or something thinking there's something wrong when there really isn't. Okay, okay let's talk for a little while about near-death experiences. These are an interesting phenomenon. Uh, I've had a few people in crisis class own that they've had what they believe to be near-death experiences. I don't think I've had one, but I went out on ether as a child and had really strange dreams that I think approximated some of this, a sense of, of soaring through the cosmos, of being far, far away from planet Earth, you know, and uh, most people I've talked to said that's the drug doing that to you. There are some people who believe what is related as near-death experiences are actually uh, chemically induced behaviors around the brain at, at the time that the body is in trauma. But I've had two or three people tell me that they were critically ill in an operating room. In one case, uh, 
uh, the, the female was brought back through shock to the heart. And, but anyway, these people have described being out of their bodies, you know, the, up on the ceiling or in the corner of the room. There are books such as Beyond Death's Door, um, now the other title, so, yeah, Life After Death. Uh, Dr. Raymond Moody, who was a cardiologist, uh, was one of the early writers and, and recorded these experiences because often, or not often, but from time to time, when people are on treadmill uh, stress tests, they go into cardiac arrest. And so it's not unusual in the cardiologist's office to have to resuscitate someone. And there would be people coming back who would recall experiences that could not be accounted for any other way. Uh, things like knowing what kind of tie the paramedic had on who put them on the stretcher and took them to the hospital and was long gone after they were resuscitated in surgery. You know, so, so there is some documentation of those kinds of things. I think you have to sort out whether, how you're going to respond to a person who, be, how you're going to communicate with a person who believes that they've had a near-death experience. You know, are you going to say that's the craziest thing I've ever heard of? Or are you going to listen and affirm? Uh, are you just going to listen passively, you know, what are you going to do uh, with this information? Uh, the, the books we just mentioned, as well as uh, Kalisha's book on death, grief, and caring relationships, uh, identify a number of factors. There have been some television specials that have been, they've attempted to recreate through uh, photography the kinds of experiences the people uh, accounted for having and so forth. But there seem to be three factors that uh, commonly characterize these. And, and now that the, the little paperback books like Life After Death and Beyond Death's Door have been published, more people have come forward with accounts of these experiences and have communicated uh, that information. So the three factors that seem to, to run across all of the cases that were reported in the studies are one, mystical, and you've got subsets there, uh, and then we'll come to factor two, depersonalization, and three, hyper-alertness. So three key <coughs> factors. Uh, but people report a feeling of great understanding, images that are sharp, are very vivid. There may be a revival of memories. There's often, and not all people experience all of these things, but most people get one or more factors or, or get subsets of each of the factors. Uh, there's a sense of harmony or unity, a kind of peace in the universe. Often there's a feeling of joy. Uh, there may be a, a sense of revelation that things just make a lot more sense because they now believe that at that point of death, that, that death is not a final extermination phase, but it's a transition point between life as we know it on earth right now and a different form of life on the other side of some kind of, of metaphysical barrier. Uh, that there, this is controlled by an outside force And, of course, there are many, many different interpretations of what God is from an old gray-headed man on a throne to the great energy source of the universe to some sort of unisex entity and so forth. But, but typical of the near-death experiences is the sense that there is a force much greater and in far greater control than anything that we've experienced on Earth. Uh, there may be colors or visions. Uh, sometimes it's, it's uh, blending of almost like clouds and uh, uh, prisms and distortions of colors. But anyway, colors, visions, strange bodily sensations, a sense that you're in your body but you're not in your body. 
you're there but you're not there, uh, you feel something but you're not sure what it is that you feel. Thing, there's sensation but it's different. And all of those um, have been just grouped under the factor of mystical. You know, that there's something uh, unusual going on here that has a mystical element to it. Okay, the second factor is called depersonalization. And in this situation, the, the person feels apart from themselves. The, you know, literally my body's down here on the operating table uh, and I'm up here in the corner on the ceiling or uh, up in the sky or, or wherever. Uh, there's a loss of emotion. Uh, at the time it's happening, the people do not seem to be emotionally involved with their body on the operating table. Or it's not always the operating table. It may be a car wreck, and and they're up over you know viewing the car wreck, much as you would observe one on the ten o'clock news. Okay, you know this is what's happening. I see it. This is how it is. Uh, the self seems strange or unreal. You recognize that you're apart from your body, but it's such a, a unique kind of experience that it's a strange, unreal kind of phenomenon. Uh, you're detached from the body, which is very similar to body apart from self. Uh, the world seems strange or unreal. Uh, there's a wall between yourself and emotions. And again, not all of these things happen to every person, but, but one or more of these are likely to typify the individual. Body is changed in shape or size. There are strange sounds and there's an altered passage of time. And then the third factor is called hyper alertness and in that case uh, thoughts are very sharp and vivid. Things just seem crystal clear and, and it's like your, your brain just functions vividly. Thoughts may be speeded, a whole life may go through in review, and yet when the person's resuscitated, maybe they've only been out for a couple of minutes, and yet their whole life seemed to, to flash by. Uh, vision and hearing, either one or both, may be sharper. There's an altered passage of time. Thoughts and movements may seem almost mechanical. So I don't know, have, have any of you taught, you know, you may not want to own your own, you may, you can if you want to, but you know, have, you, have you ever talked with anyone who believes they've had an out-of-body experience? Jacqueline? Well, not that I've talked to somebody that's had it, but reading this, I think I had one. <laughs> oh, okay. What when happened? I, when I had my car wreck, I had a, a teenage boy come down the wrong side of the freeway and hit me head on. <clears throat> and I couldn't go anywhere. So it was the first time I wore my shoulder belt and seatbelt. And unfortunately, though, the engine and the steering wheel and the dashboard and everything came right into me. And uh, at that moment, it, a lot of these things are describing what I felt, yeah. okay. but yeah. I never thought of it as a that kind of an experience. Okay. Could, did you feel like you could see the wreck? Uh, or, or no, that? not that I could see the wreck, but I, I felt like I was I was going into off, I, so. all I could see was yellow and it was fluffy and I was gliding through and I felt nothing. I absolutely felt nothing. Yet, yet I was like like you were aware shepherd. you were somewhere. Yes. It, it's a weird feeling now that you're writing all this down going, is that what it is? <laughs> is that what happened to me? But it didn't last that long. It didn't mm -hmm. last that long. They pulled me out of the wreck and put me on the side of the road. And when, when some woman came up and pushed on my nose and said, is she dead? Is she dead? I heard that. But I couldn't respond because apparently I was in shock by that time. But I mean, I could hear it, but I couldn't feel anything. I couldn't respond. I couldn't do anything. Mm -hmm. 
but I never thought of but it you, as a near-death experience. Well, yeah. at that point, did you feel like you were in your body? No. No, okay. No. You, you were still kind of detached. I didn't know where I was. I mean, I, I, it's not like I was floating above anything, but I, I was there, but I wasn't. Mm -hmm. that, I, that doesn't make any sense, but I never thought of it as a life and death, you know, death experience. Well, you may want to read some more. On, or you may not. I don't yeah. know. You know. Oh. I was in the hospital for six weeks, though, with everything messed up. So probably it was. <laughs> Nancy. Uh, you haven't said any, or there hasn't been anything in this about seeing a light. Seems like that's, I don't know if this Oh, that is, belongs under the mystical. Yeah. The mystical. I guess I didn't <laughs> type that in there. But that's where that would fit. Uh, the sharp images, vivid images. Uh, the colors and visions, but yeah, that is to, the sensation of going through a tunnel and seeing a bright light, which for some people takes the shape of Jesus or some other religious figure. Uh, for others, it's, it's a bright light that represents God. There seems to be a point at which you can't turn back, that people get so far and then they, they realize if they go any further, They've, they've gone over some kind of line and can't return. Let me let Nancy finish and then we'll come back over. My friend that experienced this, she was, she was in the hospital and just felt like she could see herself. And then she started seeing a light and it made her real overwhelmingly happy. And then just something stopped and, and she didn't know whether it was a voice or something, just said, it's not, it's not now. And then, you know, and that's not an unusual occurrence. You know, whether it's chemically induced or whether it is an actual out of body. I mean, I'm inclined to think that, that these are near death experiences, that they are out of body experiences. <clears throat> but the evidence is still early in accumulation. But different people, the, the first account I had of this, if, if you've ever seen on television, uh, and I, it's been a long time, but they talked about occasional people that are spontaneous combustion. Their bodies, okay, well, it's a couple of people shaking their heads over here that you all can't see out there. But bodies that just for some reason ignite. And this woman, I don't even remember her name. I wish now I knew how to find her. If you're out there listening in the middle of the night, call me. Uh, we used to take our kid to the same bus stop years ago. But she had large scars like so around her and it just looked like you know these giant bubbles exploded like a gargantuan sunburn and for some reason one day we got into a conversation of that and and she's one of the people I was alerting alluding to uh, earlier who said she'd, she'd been swimming she'd done some sun tanning but hadn't been out any more than usual uh, went into her house trailer laid down on a plastic lawn chair on her beach towel to, and to just kind of drip dry and rest fell asleep. The next thing she knew, she was awake in surgery, but the information she then got later from friends was that it appeared that she had ignited and the trailer burned down. Uh, neighbors rescued her, uh, and she reported being out of her body. She had a small child who was not home at the time, and she got this same information or this discussion with, with an unseen voice that uh, you know, do you, do you want to come on, do you want to go back? And in that case, she was saying, I have a small child to take care of, I'm a single parent, I need to go back. And, and so the force, or whatever it is, this controllable, whoever it is that's in charge of all this, uh, permitted her to go back then. But she was also being pulled back into her body because they were hitting her with the paddles the electric paddles in surgery to resuscitate her. And she said that that was the most painful, horrifying thing that she had ever been through and that she personally would never resuscitate a dying patient. That, that being pulled back into her body through that electrical shock was horrible. Now that's one instance, you know, I don't know, that's, that's just an account. But, but this is how we gain information about things as when people tell their stories. The chaplain next week will tell you many stories 
of things that have happened to people, and you have to decide how appropriate they are, how much they are like what you would do in handling things. So, Allison? I was just going to comment on that a lot of people also see dead relatives or dead friends that are on the other side either saying, come with me or go back, it's not time, mm -hmm. you know, at yeah, and that's a good critical point. times. Okay. Robert? Her mind, and she said dead, dead relatives. Um, one, of my, one of my mom's friends, her mother, was living in the house with them. She was about like 78 or 79 years old. And uh, one night, or the next morning, the, old, the, the mother woke up and told her daughter and says, the angels came and told me last night that I'm going to be dying within probably about a week or so. And it totally shocked this girl who, whose daughter said, don't say things like that, you know, you know, you're, you're shocking it, you know. And kind of find out, like, three or four days later, the woman died in her sleep. So I guess that's like a pre-death experience or something. Mm -hmm. But, but I, when she said friend, friends or family, she said, I mean, that's what triggered this thing and stopped my mind. Because I thought to myself, that's kind of weird how she had a pre-death experience before she even was dead. So. You know, and, and, the, and what's the communication point of all this? I mean, are we just sitting here telling this stuff because it's weird and fun to talk about? I don't know if it's fun to talk about. What's the point, Karen? Well, of course, the point is the chances the thing time may occur, of course, that somebody's going to, someone may feel a need to share that with you, and yeah, you have to decide how, how you're going to. It would seem to me like the least you would owe anybody is at least a fair hearing, is at least, a, a, at the very least, a non-judgmental hearing. Now, and what you choose to do with the information is one thing, but, you know, that if nothing else, it falls under the category of when people need to share things, you know, other human beings deserve to listen. Good point. You know, and, and you would try not to discredit someone. Oh, don't tell me that. You know, I don't want to hear that. Or you've got to be kidding. You know, and I mean, I remember one elderly lady telling me that, that she often goes out, leaves her body early morning and, and goes out over the rooftops. And she'd talk to her doctor about this, you know, because she is able at will to leave her body and see the sunrise from above the houses. I can't do that, but I think it'd be really cool if I could, <laughs> you know. Um, but I could ruin a friendship by saying, you're crazy. And she lives out of state, so hopefully she <laughs> won't hear this example. Yeah, but you have to decide uh, as a communicator how you're going to respond to this information. And hopefully it will be to treat it with, with credibility and respect. Because we've said from the beginning of the semester that meaning is in the mind of the receiver. And for the person for whom this is happening, this is a very real thing. You know, and I don't know what you experienced, and you don't know what I experienced. I don't know what I experienced, but it's still as real today as it was, well, I can't remember if I was nine or ten years old, you know, but it, as it was then. And, and the images that occurred are still as graphic, or pretty near, you know, I think I remember a lot of what went on. And I didn't tell anybody at the time because I figured my mother would think I was crazy. You know, now you all can think I'm crazy. <laughs> okay. Ginger. Well, and, and another thing that you might run across, and this happened to my mother. She was in the hospital and she had a hysterectomy and she was sharing a room with an older woman who was nearly 90 but was having some problems and so they were sewing her up, which confused her because she didn't use that part of her anatomy anymore. Anyway, and she didn't know why they were worrying about it, why they didn't just remove it. but. Um, and she died, not as a result of the surgery. She was just very old, and she died uh, in the night. And my mother said the she knew she, my mother was recovering from surgery, and she knew she was on drugs, pain medication. But she knew that this happened because it was just wild, and and the room just turned pink. It was the middle of the night, so it was dark, and the pink just, the room just turned pink and started glowing, and and the people came screaming in code blue and dragged my mother out of the room in her bed, and you know did all this stuff. But she said. Before the doctors and nurses came rushing in, it was the most peaceful, beautiful, wonderful experience. And, she, and the woman died and didn't come back. My mother didn't ever get to talk to her to find out. But still, someone could have something like that happen. And what do you say? Well, that couldn't happen. Well, how do you know you weren't there? 
It happened to her, I believe. My mother's very sane and... Yeah, she was, I met her, she's Even though lady. she was on pain medication, that's not enough to make you imagine that. I mean, that's a lot to imagine when my mother sleeps very soundly. I'm confident that she didn't just wake up for no reason. So anyway, it's kind of a neat experience. But people could have those kinds well, of Well, and I've, to I've heard a couple of instances of reports of rooms that glowed when the, when the person died. There was a sense of extra light in the room. So you just need to decide what you're going to do with that kind of information, how you're going to handle it. Uh, may want to ask, if, I think the chaplain will probably address some of these things anyway, but if not, what kinds of questions do you have for him? How would he handle some of these things? Okay, let's pop through some tasks of the dying. We'll get into these more uh, next time. Uh, some of this we've kind of touched on already when we talked about we get angry at the person who's dying. Uh, sometimes they don't, you know, if they don't own up to the fact that they're dying, then we don't get to say thank you or I love you or some of those things we would like to say or maybe we would like to resolve differences. We don't get a chance to. Uh, but if we realize we're dying soon, sooner rather than later, then there's often a lot of unfinished business that we need to complete. We may make a special effort to resolve arguments to get our thank yous said, to tell people that we love them, to get records up to date and accessible. Some spouses do a good job of, of sharing that information, others don't. Uh, sometimes the one precedes the other and it's a matter of a parent making children face the information. The key to the safety security box is here, uh, you know, the insurance papers are there, the cemetery lots are here, those kinds of things. Okay, uh, there may be medical care needs that have to be addressed. You know, are you going to stop the chemotherapy? Are you going to uh, discontinue drugs if it's been a painful series of medications and therapies? Or is there a point where we're just going to stop that and accept the fact that death is imminent and have a relative degree of comfort in the final days or weeks. Will the person die at home or in a hospice or in the hospital? And it would be nice if the patient had some say in that. Sometimes you don't have a choice, you know, that you, you're bound to the hospital. But other times there is a choice and that decision needs to be made. Uh, can you continue a lifestyle that produces a satisfying life but an earlier death? There are some people who will say, I'm going to go on drinking, I'm going to go on smoking, I'm going to go on partying until all hours of the night. I'd rather have six weeks at the lifestyle I love than three years on chemotherapy, abstaining from everything that's made me who I am. And so that's the kind of thing that you might have to address. Okay, uh, we talked a little about this earlier, but if you, if you knew you only had six months to live, how would you allocate your time and energy resources? You know, what kind of choices would you make? Would you spend time working out your funeral arrangements? Do you care? Would you have any serious talks with anybody about anything? Or not? You know, would you revise your will? Uh, would, you, would you prepare a will? Uh, would you alter your activities? in any way. And <clears throat> another typical task for the dying is to arrange for how things will be after death. You know, do you care what happens to your material possessions? Do you want your books turned over to a library? Um, if you have young children, what will happen to them? Have you made any provision uh, for godparents or for someone to take care of them? Your pets, you know? Uh, it's a really sad thing when sometimes it's not unusual for a single person uh, to die and the pet is you know maybe in an apartment or something and it may be two or three days before the person is discovered and the poor pet is left there mourning the loss of its master possibly going hungry as well uh, but you may have really traumatized animals uh, but, you know, your funeral, is that important? Organ donation, will you donate organs or not?
And if you're going to, you need to make sure your family knows. Yeah, that would be a nice thing so that they don't just come in to snarf your body away for surgery, you know, to use all those workable parts and, and catch everybody off guard. Okay, well, no. And also so your family doesn't make other arrangements to have your body removed before they have a chance to get the organs. That's true, although usually they don't move that fast, I don't think. Still. But they might. Okay, most of you are familiar with Maslow's uh, hierarchy of needs, so we're just going to touch lightly on that. Uh, so this is sort of a blend of Maslow and Kalish and Hahn and whatever. Uh, physio, you know, <laughs> but if you've got a person who's terminally ill, uh, their physiological needs have to be met, and that may mean respirators, dialysis, special diets, painkillers, transfusions, and, and the physiological needs may very well be very different from uh, what most of us are accustomed to. Okay, we still have safety and security needs. No matter how ill we are, we need to believe that we're not going to be abandoned. We need to feel that we can trust the healthcare team. You know, if you think your doctor's a bumbling incompetent, that's not going to make you feel real secure. Oh. And Kalish gives the term safe conduct. We need to feel that we're going to have guidance through the peril and the unknown. And that's often what chaplains do. They're, they're a wise, kind, peaceful, caring voice in ICU or in the hospital room uh, to help you feel secure, to give you information, perhaps to link you uh, to the people that uh, can help you <laughs> have safe conduct. Okay, third level of Maslow's little pyramid is love and belonging needs. Uh, abandonment fits in there. And Kalish points out that abandonment without love is usually seen as the worst kind of death. You know, people can handle a lot of pain, they can handle a lot of heavy duty stuff as long as they have a good support system around them. But most people in surveys and, and interviews would say that dying alone, dying abandoned, is about the worst way it can be. And for AIDS patients, that used to be one of, one of the most serious things. Fortunately, we have a more conscientious uh, society, at least a segment, that's more responsive. But early on, when, when mode of transmission was unclear and so forth, that became a primary concern. Okay, but sometimes what happens, even though we need love and belonging, uh, people may be uncomfortable, confused, or embarrassed so that they can't respond to love. If you've not had an open family to start with, then it's, you know, at the stage of terminally ill, may be an awkward time to start expressing love to one another. And so it may become an uncomfortable, awkward Thing that you have to deal with or that you're not able to deal with. But love and belonging is important. Uh, reminiscing about loved ones who have died or who are not available or focusing on earlier deeply satisfying times may help. Uh, sometimes, you know, if this is, is an elderly person and their children have died, the, the people who would normally be part of your support system just may not be there. Or if you are old, your parents are deceased and you never had children. You know, that, there are just different things that uh, we help that if so-and-so, or maybe the people live on the other side of the world and they simply can't come home at this stage. You know, but to be able to talk about that with the person and to acknowledge that if the son who is in, the, our daughter who is in the military could be here now, that would be a great comfort and a great help. Okay, Maslow's fourth level is self-esteem needs. Uh, the dying person has a loss of competence, a loss of autonomy, and may even cause the person to welcome death. You know, when you get so incapacitated that you just can't do anything, uh, for some people at least, that makes death welcome. There's, at some point, there's a loss of physical strength, loss of sexual activity, a loss of decision-making power. Uh, there may be loss of sphincter control, which creates unpleasant odors, impacts social contacts. contacts. 
And then finally, uh, at the level of self-actualization, rapid personal growth may occur. Uh, you know, the person may get saved at the last minute in prison and get very religious. They may resolve problems. Uh, the higher order needs will be thwarted if the lower level needs are not satisfied. So we're running out of time tonight, but think on these things and we'll continue with them more uh, next week and we'll look at uh, some of the more uh, types of expressions of grief, some patterns of bereavement, and how we can help people who are in those different stages.